Hello and welcome to the PowerPoint um, lecture presentation for week um, two of Philosophy 111. And this week we're going to get into um, the discussion of the philosophy of Martin Heidegger, who's who's one of the most um, one of the most well-known thinkers on technology in the 20th century. And in particular, the essay um, he wrote in the 1930s called The Essence of Technology uh, was very, very influential and developed a kind of philosophical um, perspective on technology that was a, that was a, a really a dominant perspective um, in philosophical thinking about technology, particularly in Europe for, um, for a long time in the 20th century. Um, and it was only later that this perspective has come to be um, sort of criticized and, um, and that other sort of perspectives have, have been developed which which set out other sides of technology, its social influence um, and how to understand its sort of relation to science and culture and everything like that. But Heidegger's, Heidegger's take on technology was was very influential. So um, it's worthwhile us taking a, a look at it this week and we, we're going to look at Heidegger particularly through the lens of Albert Borgman, who um, developed a, a theory of, of technology that was um, largely indebted to Heidegger's views and sort of develops some of his ideas in, in more um, in, in more easy to understand, I think, terms than Heidegger did. Heide Heidegger's thinking and way of writing is um, notoriously um, obscure and, and difficult to penetrate. So it's helpful to look at some of um, some of Borgman's writings to get a sort of concrete sense of what the implications are of the um, of the the theory of technology that that Heidegger develops. And so we'll be we'll be looking at Borgman, and we'll also look at a um, a criticism of some of Heidegger's uh, views, and, and in particular Borgman's views um, from Andrew Feinberg. And as we'll see later in the course, Feinberg represents a, a a different perspective um, on technology. He's he's part of a sort of social constructivist line of thinking about technology that has emerged, I'd say, in the last 30, 40 years or so. Okay, so let's let's start thinking about Heidegger. Heidegger's claim is is a claim about the essence of technology, um, and this is something that marks it as a philosophical perspective that Heidegger's really asking the question, what what makes something technology? What's what's the essence of technology? What's the what's the essence of anything technological? What makes it technological in its very idea, in, in its essence, in its core, its sort of core properties, if, if you like? And in the essence of technology, the essay that Heidegger writes in the 1930s, he uses this um, interesting phrase when he writes that the essence of technology is by no means anything technological. And the claim that he's making here is essentially that we should not we shouldn't confuse technological artifacts, in other words, things, the sort of technological devices and things that that we associate with technology, the tools and things, with what technology actually means. Um, so technology is a kind of it is a kind of frame, a sort of frame of meaning. It's not essentially a sort of collection of things. Um, and we talked about some of those debates next week, the idea of, of, of technology as a sort of um, as a set of tools or is there something else to it? Well, for Heidegger, that that's something else is the essence of technology that comes before modern technology. So it's it's not it's not a tool or it's not a thing. It's it's an idea or more specifically, it's a way of of framing the world as being a certain way, um, and so it's a kind of it's a kind of perspective that that comes from our minds that that sets out the world in a certain way um, as being technological, and following from that we get technology as a sort of practical world of of developing artifacts and and sort of useful tools and functions and so on, but all of that comes out of this idea of of essence of this idea of how we look at things. Um, so it's that essence for Heidegger, which remember is not a thing, it's it's an idea, it's a way of looking, a way of looking at the world. That's the thing that makes modern technology possible and that's the thing that we can characterize as the essence of modern technology. 
So what is this essence that Heidegger talks about? What makes it um, what what makes what makes up the essence of technology? And Heidegger describes this um, modern technology as a challenging. So um, it, it, in the modern world, when technology is, is so important and so powerful and so central to our lives, um, it takes the form, Heidegger says, of a kind of challenging. Um, and he says, again, this is from the essence of technology, that the revealing that rules in modern technology is a challenging. In other words, so the, the way that we reveal the world um, through our technological perspective, through the, the idea of technology, the way that we reveal the world through that idea is, is, is a challenging, in other words, by challenging it. So what Heidegger means is, is the way modern technology reveals the world, um, what it reveals is as a store of resources, the world is a store of resources to be used and exploited. Okay, so that's the sense in which a challenge, it's it's a challenging, it's sort of, it's challenging the world to sort of, to show itself as a sort of productive store of resources, of stored oil and, and, um, um, and different sort of um, forms of valuable stones um, and all the sort of valuable um, minerals and things that, that we excavate. So the, the world is, the world is the store of resources that's to be used and exploited by human beings. Um, and it's so it's, it's the idea of technology in our minds that sort of makes that possible. That's that's what reveals technology. Um, the, that's what reveals the world in this sense as a stock of resources. And that's what makes possible all of the sort of um, the devices and machines of modern technology emerges on the basis of the way that the world has been revealed. The earth is revealed as a coal mine, mining district, for instance. The soil is revealed as a mineral deposit. Um, and so it's and so we sort of look at the world based on all the useful things that we can extract from it. OK, so it's that it's that framing idea, the framing of the world as a useful resource or as a stock of resources that then sort of sets up the way modern technology works. So that's that's Heidegger's outline of, of the essence of technology. The example Heidegger gives for, it, for this, again, in the essence of technology is the Rhine River, a famous site where where Heidegger lived um, in southern Germany. So the Rhine is a is a challenging. The Rhine is challenged to be a store of energy. So the river, um, with the the sort of idea of technology, with this frame that we use to sort of see the world, this sort of essence of technology, we don't see the river as a kind of uh, peaceful um, a peaceful place to go and to go and sit and enjoy the enjoy the scenery. We don't see it maybe um, as something we can sort of participate. We can sort of um, join with we can we can get in a boat and sort of row down the river instead there's a kind of more radical challenging so so the river is revealed as as a potential store of energy which is useful for human beings um, and so this is the the the, um, the electric power plant on, on the river here in this picture that um, that Heidegger is talking about this. So this is the way that modern technology challenges the river to be a source of, of energy. It's a, it's 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 sort of it's um its capacity to be useful um, is drawn out of it by by technology and this sort of the, the machines and devices that technology constructs to realize its aims. So modern technology, in contrast to older forms of a poiesis, or that's a Greek word for older forms of creation, of making. Uh, modern technology exploits and exhausts the earth. So that's a that's a claim that Heidegger makes that that there's a difference here with older sort of um, older sort of frames of looking at things which didn't have this this idea of technology when the world um, for for the ancient Greeks, for example, according to Heidegger, wasn't seen as just this kind of reserve, this kind of resource waiting to be exploited. But the Greeks had a more, the ancient Greeks had a more kind of symbiotic relationship with the world. They were part of it. They weren't standing opposed to it and sort of inspecting it and challenging it. So this for Heidegger is a distinctive thing about, about modern technology, about the world of the last several hundred years, which has sort of created this, this idea of challenging and has sort of built devices and machines to to embody this um, this basic idea of the world as a store of resources. 
So the world comes to be, and everything in it comes to be seen as what Heidegger calls standing reserve. So everywhere everything is ordered to stand by, this is from the technology essay, to be immediately on hand in order to stand there just so that it may be on call for further ordering. So it, everything's ready for use. Everything's at human disposal and ready to be used, to be called upon, to be employed in satisfying human purposes and particular functions. So the airliner on the runway um, is a means of transport at our disposal. It's sort of standing reserve. It's waiting to be used, waiting to be called up for, um, to be useful for human purposes. And of course, people are transfer transformed into standing reserve as well um, in the idea of human resources, uh, which which is a sort of, you know, most corporations have a human resources department, but it suggests the idea as, as well that people are, um, people are a kind of resource to be used, sort of standing by ready to be useful as, as well. So it's not like, it's not like this idea stops at things, but extends the, the idea of standing reserve to every single thing, um, including living things and including human beings. All right, so Heidegger uses this idea of enframing um, in the technology essay, sort of capture this way um, of, of sort of revealing the that modern that there's this essence of modern technology that sort of enframes the world. So in framing, Heidegger writes, means the way of revealing that holds sway in the essence of modern technology and that is itself nothing technological, right? So it's, again, it's a way of revealing, but is not itself um, a piece of technology. So the frame of mind through which we view the world, the sort of lens we use, the frame we use to sort of look at things, discloses the world as available for human exploitation. Things are there standing reserve, um, ready to be used by us. But this frame is nothing technological because it lies behind every technology that we use. So it's not a, it's not a particular technology. It's something that makes possible the technological way of looking at things. <coughs> so for example, we can say that physics frames nature as a realm of calculable forces making which makes possible new ways of exploiting it such as atomic energy um so physics is kind of the frame that <coughs> excuse me that reveals nature as being a certain way that sort of makes nature um makes nature exposed to us as as being a certain way with certain properties and certain characteristics and that in framing uh, makes possible certain sort of um, other concrete technological things like atomic energy, which sort of develop according to the, the sort of logic of, of the frame. But the frame itself, because it lies behind and makes possible technology, um, Heidegger says it is itself nothing technological. So this is really why, you know, Heidegger's view is called an essentialist view, because it, it it argues that there's this essence of technology that's, which is essentially just this way of looking at the world um, that's sort of come to characterize our modern age that we all sort of look at the world like this or we, we sort of train to look at the world like this. So that lies behind technology and makes it possible. Heidegger also talks about, um, and th this will be important when we look at Borgman and, and we'll see the sort of logic of this when he talks about focal things and practices. Um, but he has some interesting things to say um, in another essay he wrote on the work of art in the 1930s. Um, and he says this on the ancient Greek temple, which nowadays, of course, if you go and visit, it's, it's, it's like a ruin. You can sort of go and look around, but it doesn't, it doesn't have a function anymore. It doesn't have a place. It's an ancient um, it's an ancient ruin that once had a function in, in ancient Greek life, um, but is now kind of, is now just kind of standing there. So Heidegger says, it is the temple work that first joins together and simultaneously gathers around itself the unity of those parts and relations in which birth and death, disaster and blessing, victory and disgrace, endurance and decline, obtain the form of destiny for human being. The temple first gives to things their luck and to humanity their outlook on themselves, right? So he's, 
this is a little bit different from um, what he's saying about technology as a kind of um, as a kind of making things possible as a standing reserve. Here, when he talks about art and when he talks about architect, you know, architecture here, like like the temple, um, he's seeing. He's basically saying that the temple sort of forms as a kind of focal unity of of Greek life, and when you go through various phases of birth and death and so on. Um, it's, you know, those things take place. The meaning of those things is lived in relation to the temple and in relation to what it represents, the gods and how they protect um, the city and how they protect human beings. Um, and all of this is sort of joined together and it brings the community together and it it provides meaning to the different festivals and times of year that are celebrated by the community. Um, so it's a it's a sort of it's a it's a way of sort of celebrating the the meaning of, of the community. So this is a kind of there's a kind of contrast here with what Heidegger says about technology, which is a almost a kind of you know a, a sort of decontextualizing, taking things out of um, out of their context, making them available as useful things for human beings. Here it's something else that's that's going on. A, a thing is sort of serving to to bring to bring meaning to human lives to sort of to to make possible community and so on and we'll, we'll see this when we talk about Borgman um, and turning to Borgman now we'll see um, in his essay focal things and practices how he takes up um, <clears throat> many of the the um, the themes that we see in Heidegger um, and he would develop a um, a number of sort of ways of looking that that, that develop Heidegger's thinking and allow us to see um, the way in which we might sort of apply it to um, to some contemporary questions. So Borgman says Heidegger began to see technology as the force that has eclipsed the focusing powers of pre-technological times. Um, so we can see that in the in the temple and the contrast with with how technology sort of um, sort of prevents that focusing by by setting out things as sort of useful things standing ready for human use. Borgman then goes on to say, but how are we to recover the orientation? Sorry, how are we to recover orientation in the oblivious and distracted era of technology when the great embodiments of meaning, the works of art, have lost their focusing power? So again, that's a sort of Heideggerian idea that it's 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 works of art. It's sort of public um, public ceremonies, public buildings like temples and stuff, which give um, which give a, a community its sort of power and its its sort of its font of meaning that allows us to that allows it to um, find significance in daily life and, and ordinary events. Um, so how do we um, how do we recover that in the present when when maybe we can't rely on works of art to sort of to um, to fulfill that focusing power. So Borgman asks whether we can recover the orientation <coughs> provided by focal things in the world of technological everyday life. So the role that Heidegger sees as being played by the Greek temple, you know, are there sort of ordinary everyday things and ordinary everyday practices where we can see um, some similar kind of source of meaning that people are relying on and returning to and drawing around. Um, and he gives us a couple of examples in, in his essay. So running, um, the first example he gives us and the, the sort of the practice of running and what it does to the body and the mind in unison. And Borgman says the runner is mindful of the body because the body is intimate with the world. Thus, the unity of ends and means of mind and body and of body and world is one and the same. It makes itself felt in the vividness with which the runner experiences reality. All right, so it's very much a sort of embodied um, sense of reality. My, mind and body are, are one and the same, are working together. Um, and, and through sort of um, through experiencing reality, in this distinctive way of sort of passing through it, but not in a way that you're sort of sheltered sort of inside a car or a vehicle, but you're exposed to the elements. Um, 
Borgman describes this as a sort of meaningful experience, one where we can become intimate with, with the world because of this union of mind and body. Now, the second example he uses um, is the culture of the table. And this example, I think, is, is a little bit more familiar. Um, and we can see it in this, this quote that he uses where he says, the great meal of the day gathers the scattered family around the table, but it also recollects and presents a tradition. It brings into focus closer relations of national and regional customs and more intimate traditions still of family recipes and dishes. So, so the, the, the great meal, in other words, the, the kind of communal meal where everybody comes together um, and it maybe it uses sort of local um, local ingredients. It uses family recipes, maybe. So there's a kind of there's a historical link here. Um, same in the the temple, um, the Greek temple that Heidegger talks about. There's a kind of historical link going back to family the family practice into the past, ways of doing things that are passed on to generation, local customs which kind of enhance. Um, the coming together and give it a kind of form. Um, so it's a kind of it's a kind of tradition that people live, experience, but also but also pass on, um, pass on to the next generation of sort of this way of doing things. So you can see there's a kind of, you know, calling it the culture of, of the table sort of makes sense. There's a there's a distinct culture, a distinct way of doing things which is passed on um, from history and is and is passed on by present people to the to the next generation um, and sort of holds, brings people together, represents a kind of celebration um, and, and sort of ha so has a number of interlinked meanings. Now, the, the contrast with this, of course, is the kind of meal that's provided by modern technology and, you know, the, the sort of microwave meal. Um, that's become a sort of stark contrast to sort of family meal that's cut with fresh um, homegrown vegetables, perhaps, and is, is sort of the family works at making it, the family works together to prepare it. So here it's a, with a microwave meal, it seems to be a, a completely different kind of sensory experience. And this is the way that Borgman describes it. He says, this living texture is being rent through the procurements of food as a commodity. So the living texture of the family meal is being rent through the procurements of food as a commodity and the replacement of the culture of the table by the food industry. Once food has become freely available, so in other words, it's not something you have to prepare and it's not something you have to get a family together to um, to, to cook and prepare and garnish and everything else. But once food has become freely available, it is only consistent that the gathering of the meal is shattered and disintegrates into snacks, TV dinners, bites that are grabbed and eaten. So that, as you can see, the description here is very different to the description of the family meal, um, bites that are grabbed and eaten. So it's as though, it's as though the act of, of eating has no intrinsic significance. It's been sort of torn out of the context um, that gave it a kind of significance within this family practice. And once torn out of that context, it's just a kind of disembodied, a kind of disengaged, um, disembodied eating that doesn't, that doesn't hook up with any, any, any sort of greater um, family or communal or local or regional meanings that sort of give the um, give the act of eating this this sort of broader sense. So Borgman makes this contrast between this kind of fast food eating, um, the microwave meal, and the family meal, which kind of pulls in all these traditions of history and passes them on through time. So let's sort of get, get this down here, why Borgman says that the gathering of the meal is shattered uh, when the family meal is replaced by fast food, right? Why is there a, why is there a shattering? And Borgman says this is because the, um, the fast food meal 
decontextualizes eating food from the traditions, beliefs, and shared habits that make it a meaningful experience in the setting of family life. So we and we can think about in and the the idea of ends and means. <coughs> excuse me to to really sort of make this point. So the end, which is eating here, so the end of of any kind of activity involving food is eating, satisfying our our need for nourishment. Here in the microwave meal, the end is separated from the context. And the context then becomes an indifferent means for satisfying the end. And for Borgman, this is this is very typical of what modern technology does and the way that it works, the separation of context or means from end, so that the end can be sort of abstracted and, and satisfied by different technological solutions. But the problem is that the technological solutions, um, the technology the technological solutions, <coughs> what they do is they shatter the sort of background traditions um, that were the traditional means of providing the end. So in this case, the family meal, everybody's sitting down at a table sharing in the cooking and the preparing, right? That means then becomes a kind of uh, an indifferent means to satisfy the end of eating rather than the kind of the very thing that gives the meal its meaning, the very thing that gives eating its very significance. And that's Borgman's point. So he says the means, the family traditions, etc., can be replaced by technology, the microwave, and then we we have a kind of we have an, an eating, which is the end of the activity, which then becomes a, a an entirely um, sort of meaningless, almost a, a, an entirely material thing that has no broader cultural meaning that gives significance to it. So the idea of focal practice becomes important here in, in Borgman's way of looking at things. He says that the point of a focal practice is to protect the thing that is integral to the practice to shield it against the technological direction into means and ends. So a focal practice is supposed to prevent that separation, that direction into an end and various kinds of means for satisfying the end that he sees as, as central to technology's um, way of looking at things. And once that separation comes in, then of course, you know, any sort of technological device can satisfy um, the need for food and the sort of traditions of family eating that were part of food become, become sort of in different means that you can dispense with. So a focal practice keeps faith with focal things and saves for them an opening in our lives. So it's that, you know, the way the temple, the Greek temple for Heidegger works as a kind of focal, a, a sort of communal focus of Greek life. For Borgman, this is what focal practices do in general. They shield against that separation um, into means and ends. So modern technology in general separates the end or commodity that it delivers from the broader context or means of its delivery. And so that this basic idea, which for Borgman, um, as we've seen, this characterizes modern technology and it leads to what he calls the device paradigm, um, where, where we begin to look for devices to sort of create, construct technological devices to satisfy ends. Um, but in doing so, we, we risk sort of shutting off the broader sources of meaning that give um, that gives significance to the ends that we pursue. So, you know, eating becomes a purely material sort of act, de de deprived of its broader family and traditional sort of significance. And so, there, you know, we can see that logic. Um, and and as, as we'll see, people have used the same kind of arguments about education, that when you take it out of its face-to-face -face kind of delivery, that it becomes, um, it becomes something completely different, a different, um, the you know the end is sort of divorced from from the means and the means are what the sort of face-to-face -face interaction are what gives education its sort of power to change lives and stuff. So we'll we'll talk about some of that and I'm not you know obviously that's of special importance to us here in a in a distance learning class um, and, and I think I think there's there's something about that criticism but I think I think there's there are there are very good answers to it so we'll we'll take a look at that when we get to um, 
look critically at this view of, of Heidegger and Borgman. So Borgman develops this contrast between wealth and affluence based on, you know, this idea of sort of um, technology as giving us the ends, you know, giving us the prize almost without sort of the, the means. And that's what he describes as, as a kind of affluence. So affluence consists in the possession and consumption of the most numerous refined, most numerous, the most refined and varied commodities. Um, so affluence is about the possession of things and it sees, um, you know, it sees, it sort of sees itself in terms of, um, of the kind of possession and consumption of useful things. So that's very much in, in line with the way Borgman describes modern technology as this sort of, you know, making possible, uh, making it possible for us to, to, to get possession of ends without necessarily having to go through the troublesome work of the sort of traditional means and ways of doing things that, that were originally part of, part of getting to the end. So wealth in contrast is homely in the sense of being plain and simple, but homely also in allowing us to be at home in our world, intimate with its great things, and familiar with our fellow human beings. Um, so yeah, it's kind of, it's um, it's a little bit vague that the way he sort of writes this, isn't it? It's hard for us to sort of get a sense of um, of what this would look like, but it's clear there's a there's a contrast with traditional um, traditional ways of doing things when people are are sort of working together as part of a tradition, um, and Borgman clearly thinks that the you know the way technology has sort of broken up a lot of these traditions or sort of worked to 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 break up these traditions um has had many sort of negative consequences okay let's turn to andrew feenberg's um essay which was the, the second essay we're looking at this week and feenberg's essay gives us a, um, a critical perspective really on the Heidegger and Borgman um, take on things. So it's it's worthwhile really um, taking a look at this. And we'll, we'll, we'll be looking at Borgman's, I'm sorry, we'll be looking at Feenberg's own view um, of technology. He's, um, he's part of a social constructionist line of thinking as we'll see. We'll look at his view um, in a few weeks a bit later in the course. But here we, we're gonna, um, we, we're going to look at his criticisms of the um, of this sort of Borgman and Heidegger essentialist view of technology. Okay, let's start by saying something about technological determinism. And this is the way um, this is the way that that Feinberg and others characterize Heidegger Heidegger's theory and by implication Borgman's as, as well. They call it a form of technological determinism. And technological determinism refers to a kind of a reductionist theory that presumes that a society's technology drives the development of its social structure and cultural values. Right? So, so the technology comes first, or the for Heidegger, the tech the idea of technology comes first, and that idea then determines what technology what that technology is going to look like socially in other words it determines how it develops and how it affects cultural values and both heidegger and borgman we can say sort of endorse this view in seeing modern technology as a kind of idea that then that then sort of determines its social effects so the idea drives the effects um and and we don't we don't need to look you know, we don't need to look that closely at what happens in society, at who's making technology, why they make it, what their purposes are. We don't need to get into those questions because all we need is this idea of tech. All we need is this this sort of philosophical understanding of the idea of technology. So that's a sort of um, that's a sort of essentialist or determinist um, perspective. Um, and so that and we can see that both Borgman and Heidegger have um, certainly is, uh, sort of seem to be close to this idea. <clears throat> so there's two general ideas in, in de technological determinism, that the development, 
the development of technology itself follows a predictable, traceable path largely beyond cultural or political influence. All right, so you can sort of, in other words, you can, you can predict from the essence of technology how it's going to play out socially, what's going to happen, how it's going to affect different practices, what it's going to do. So you can sort of predict that. That technology in turn, um, the second view, has effects on societies that are inherent rather than socially conditioned or produced because that society organizes itself to support, to support and further develop a technology once it has been introduced. Right. So the effects, in other words, are inherent in the technology. They don't depend on how that technology is developed socially. They don't depend on who develops it or why they develop it. Everything just depends on the, the sort of structure or the character um, or the idea of a technology. And so once it's developed, it just follows its own kind of linear um, intrinsic development path. And what happens socially doesn't really affect it. All right, so technological determinism is often seen as a sort of um, in opposition to social constructivism. So if we can lay out here their basic, um, their basic patterns, um, whereas technological determinism argues that technology influences society, but but the converse doesn't hold. So society does not influence um, technology influences society, but society does not influence technology. Whereas for social constructivism, society influences technology. That's a sort of basic difference that for constructivists, as we'll see, um, society influences the course, the sort of um, the basic um, frame of technology, not just the, um, the sort of practical effects of it. So only technological factors for determinism, not social ones, determine the success or failure of a technology. So for social constructivism, it's social factors that contribute to the success or failure, <coughs> including how it fits in with the plans of a particular social group, whether it promotes their interests or not. For social constructivism, all of those questions will be relevant, whereas for determinism, they are not. For determinism, successful technologies are inherently superior and their success is evidence of that. Um, failed technologies are inherently inferior. So the fact that something is successful means that it's a superior technology um, for determinism. But for constructivism, a successful um, technology is not necessarily superior, but there's a story to be told, a social story about how it became success successful or about how a different technology failed that may have nothing to do with its superiority or its inherent qualities as a technology but again be explained by how it fits in with with a particular social group's needs how it serves their interests um, and so on so for determinism techn technology develops linearly in other words it's one single chain of development um, for constructivism, technological development occurs recursively, so it's a repeating thing. It's not a single um, developing chain. It's a, it's a repeating thing that repeats in different ways, again, depending on the social context. So Feinberg is a critic of essentialist views of technology, and he says that essentialism basically holds that technology has a fixed or unchanging essence, right? Heidegger's view of technology as a revealing of the world as standing reserve. Um, so it has a fixed or unchanging essence and one can account for all the important social and cultural consequences of technology by understanding this essence, right? So critics of essentialism like Feinberg dispute that claim. They dispute that technology has an essence and by implication that one can understand the, the important social and cultural consequences by simply by understanding that essence. Borgman's idea of the device paradigm, for instance, suggests that because technology separates means and ends, it will always be a threat to personal and cultural meaning, right? So what technology does, and again, remember our, our example here is the microwave versus the, the family meal, 
right what technology does is it is it separates ends out of their context and by disembedding them it robs them of that background of meaning that that background of culture or tradition uh, which gives things significance um, and you know that that for, for Borgman is a sort of general uh, a sort of general take on technology think of the difference between watching say a sporting you know a get a, a sporting contest on TV versus versus actually going to the stadium and and sort of watching a game live again you could say with with the latter when you when you go when you go and watch a game live you have a sort of tradition um a tradition of joining with other people of, of sort of singing songs um of sort of living out a commitment to the team in public when you um when you sort of abstract that context again when you separate the end watching the game from all of the means of sort of getting there and joining and and participating and so on then you you get a completely passive activity of of watching a game on tv um which maybe may turn out to be a very different experience and for, for borgman it will be um it, it will embody this idea of a threat to personal and cultural meaning right so so that that experience of of a game of a sporting contest is far less uh, meaningful than one where you where you're part of a sort of tradition of of going to a game and it's one that's lived culturally uh, maybe with a sort of local group or, or whatever so that that sort of embeds the end in a framework of cultural meaning now um Feinberg argues and, and we're going to look at this example in more depth later on but it's an um, interesting example to use here because we can we can sort of see the computer in in these terms as uh, uh, and we can ask the question of whether you know wh whether again like Borgman we see it as as something that sort of takes sort of separates ends and means um in, and in doing so gives us an end but divorces it from its sort of broader background of meaning um so you know can we understand something like this um in, so can we understand how the computer works and online education can we understand how that works by this idea of sort of separation of means and ends and sort of cutting out of meaning um but certainly there's a sort of um we, we can ask a question here as well about de determinism whether you know whether there's whether like Borgman and Heidegger say there's there's an idea of technology which is just sort of realized in things like the computer or whether when we look at the actual process by which um, the computer developed whether we see something different going on um, and Feinberg argues that when we look at the actual sort of social process and this is what social constructionists do they sort of look at look at the actual process by which a technology became um, came to be socially dominant um, and look at you know the process of, of, def of struggle with other groups and contestation um, so it's it became a medium of content con of communication Feinberg says through a process of social contestation in which different groups sought to impose their favored perspectives and again so for constructionists it's not you know you don't you can't predict you can't there's nothing that determines what the computer is going to mean socially right that's something that's fought over by different social groups who are putting forward their perspective so so when he talks about the computer in this chapter <coughs> Feinberg is making that point that it it became what it is today through a process of contestation there's there was nothing that sort of determines its particular use and its value and its meaning that emerged through a, a sort of social process involving different groups all right so what Feinberg does here is is he tries to to um to combine these two perspectives of essentialism um, and social constructivism we're going to talk about these two perspectives more going forward but it's it's worth sort of introducing them here and Feinberg gives us a um a, a, an interesting way of, of sort of thinking about them because he presents in in this in this paper he presents a a kind of view in which we can see them working together and he does that by by developing this idea of primary in instrumentalization 
and secondary instrumentalization. And the primary in instrumentalization draws upon a lot of those things that Heidegger and Borgman say are part of the essence of technology. Um, and Fiedenberg wants to say that this is just the first moment. In other words, these things help us get a get a purchase on things, help us help us develop a functional perspective in which we can find a technological solution. But without the second moment, what he calls the secondary instrumentalization, um, these these things are not don't by themselves give us an idea of technology and how it works. So so these these are kind of like the the essence view, but by themselves they are um, they are insufficient. So the the four that he mentions decontextualization. So it's deworlding something, taking it out of its context, so that it can be sort of integrated into a into a technical system. Um, you know, reducing something to its useful properties, which is part of number two, reductionism. Uh, things are reduced to those aspects. <clears throat> through which they can be enrolled in a technical network. Um, so things are reduced to their useful properties, made to seem as though um, they are their useful properties and nothing more. Third, auto autonomization, which is um, an interesting one. And it's the way that technical action isolates itself as much as possible from the effects of its action on objects. Um, so think of for every, you know, how you can sort of maximize the power you can bring to bear on an object by using heavy equipment without sort of feeling the blowback effects on yourself. That's a part of, of autonomization. So the user or the subject is isolated from its effects. Um, so technical action autonomizes the subject, Feinberg says, by interrupting the feedback between the object and its actor. And the fourth one he talks about is positioning, um, where often it's sort of positioning yourself in a passive relation to objects in order to in order to sort of modify the law that the laws governing them or use those laws to our advantage. So not not sort of pushing them or intervening, but for example, the laws of combustion, you know, using those laws to help us um, to help us manipulate objects to our advantage. So all those things that are the way we sort of make, you know, make it possible to put things into a technological context. But it's the second part of this, the secondary instrumentalization, where we actually do the work of recontextualizing things that Feinberg thinks is the most important. So the secondary instrumentalization is, a, is an integration um, of things with their natural technical and social environment. So the natural environment, the earth, um, the natural world, the technical environments are sort of existing stock of technical things and resources, and the social environment, the world in which human beings relate to one another through social institutions um, and practices and so on. So the four things that he mentions here are systematization, in which the decontextualized natural objects um, from the first part must then be recombined um, and re-embedded in their natural environments. So then we have to sort of re-enroll them, re-embed them um, in, in the sort of environment, making sure that they can function in their context, um, making sure that they're protected from the elements and so on. The second is mediation. Um, and he's he mentions particularly ethical and aesthetic mediations here. Um, which supply the technical object with secondary qualities that embed it into its new social context. Um, so ethical sort of properties um, and aesthetic properties, how something looks, how it how it integrates with other features of where, you know, if it's a household item, it has to integrate um, aesthetically with other items and so on. Um, so that's mediation and vocation. Um, is taking back the uh, sort of almost revoking the autonomization. Um, so here it's it's the, the subject not as sort of autonomous, but as deeply engaged with its object and sort of deeply engaged with its with, with what's happening to its object. Um, so it's the reverse impact on users of their involvement with tools of the trade. So um, for example, the chopper of wood becomes a carpenter's and then you sort of take on Feinberg says that sort of vocation, that sort of identity, 
as somebody who chops wood. So you make yourself, you know, you sort of, um, instead of being separated from the life process, you become part of the process in which in which technology is formed and developed. Um, and the, the final one initiative um, is a certain margin of maneuver um, becomes possible of people in in subordinate positions. Um, so revoking the sort of positioning thing where you're not sort of um, passively passively observing the laws and using the laws of objects and how they work to draw out their sort of functionality. But instead, you're sort of adapt, adapting things, intervening um, and and actually sort of um, using initiative to to adapt and change things. So those are the four ways in which in the secondary instrumentalization in which things are kind of re-embedded in the environment that again for Feenberg is really important is a, is a sort of constitutive feature of how technology works. Um, and we can't just sort of dismiss this as, as a sort of secondary, you know, stage of how it becomes a social thing. For Feenberg, this is crucial to understanding what technology means, that secondary instrumentalization actually um, makes a difference for the, the, the embedded meaning and the significance of technology in our lives. Finally, Feenberg talks about <clears throat> Western technology and capitalism, and I think this is this is a um, this is a perceptive point to make in relation to Heidegger and Borgman, because what it means and what Feenberg's saying here is that the things that essentialism ascribes to modern technology are actually the result of modern Western capitalism. So the way that Heidegger describes technology, the standing reserve, the way it challenges the earth to be productive, to be useful, to sort of give us these useful resources. For Feinberg, it's actually modern capitalism. So the world of capitalism as it's grown up since the 17th century, um, in the last several centuries, it's modern capitalism that has organized the technical con control of workers um, and which dispense with the traditional responsibilities for persons and places that accompanied technical power in the past. So the use of, of the earth and natural resources as standing reserve and the use of people in natural reserve, you could make a strong argument that those things um, are as a result of, of the development of capitalism. In other words, it's a sort of development of modern Western society, economics and culture. Um, and those and that development has in turn driven and influenced the development of modern technology, which has come to take on a lot of the sort of features of technical control um, of workers and to take on the features of sort of challenging um, that has characterized the, the sort of the modern capitalist view of the earth and the natural environment. And that has simply been reflected in the way that technology works. So against Borgman and Heidegger, it's not technology that's, it's not the idea of technology that's driving this process. It's the sort of cultural, social, economic um, logic of Western capitalism that is influencing technology. So a quote from Feinberg on page 71, he says, it is this capitalist technical rationality that is reflected in the essentialism of Heidegger and Borgman. Because they characterize technology by the privileged instrumentalizations of capitalist modernity, they are unable to develop a socially and historically concrete conception of it. Okay, so they, the privileged instrumentalizations of capitalist modernity, in other words, those that work of disembodiment, um, of taking things out of their context, that's part of the primary instrumentalization. Heidegger and Borgman associate that with the idea of technology, but they can't sort of reflect on the fact that that's, you know, that's that's a result of, of the social, uh, of, the, of the society and culture of capitalism affecting how we think about technology. So some thoughts to conclude with. Um, and so what, what we come upon here by sort of looking at this, this view of essence and social practices, how far can we explain technology without accounting for the social historical context in which it is always embedded? So is it is it something like an idea that stays the same across time? Or is it something which changes according to 
how it's how it emerges in social historical context. That's a central point of contention between the the essentialist or determinist view and the social constructivist view. Also, can we imagine different technologies that would embody different values? Respect and concern for the environment, respect for the person and humane living spaces. And of course, if, if we can imagine that, then that would be another point in favor of social constructivism, that technology is not determined to just develop one particular way to sort of embody you know, one particular idea, one particular way of looking, but technology can actually embody different values and in different social contexts can be made to embody values like respect and humanity um, <clears throat> and respect for diversity and so on. And everything depends on, on sort of on the way technology is developed in context. So these are things we're going to be thinking about going forward in this course.